Awesome. Thank you. And thank you to everybody that's uh, joined us this morning for breakfast burritos and avoiding burnout. We're glad you made it and we'll be having a few more people join us here in a minute. Um, the first thing I want to do is just um, thank our two interpreters, um, Jade and Hannah, and also Susie for keeping us honest and on track. And I thought it'd be good before we jumped into the presentation uh, to introduce ourselves because I'm looking at all these names and I know about 60% of you. So Marianne, you want to introduce yourself first? Sure. <clears throat> I'm Marianne Valentino and I teach psychology. I've been teaching psychology for I think over 20 years now. And I also am the lead facilitator for the Ram Racial Equity Lab. Um, Mr. Henderson. Morning, everyone. My name is Sean Henderson. I'm the Dean of Student Services here at Fresno City College. I am uh, starting my 25th year here at FCC. And today I will be the remote control. <laughs> And hello, everybody. My name is Lydia Anderson. I teach business and I have not yet learned how to say no, which is why I am here today. So um, let's get going. And I think we'll kind of learn together and explore a little bit more about how we can create a welcoming structured learning environment. Oh, I think I'm up. <laughs> so <laughs> we know why we're here. And we were really pleased to see uh, over 40 people sign up for today's event. We would like to know what brought you here. And so Lydia just put a Jamboard link into the chat. And if you click on that, that should take you to our Jamboard. And if you've never used a Jamboard before, you're gonna learn how to use that and maybe wanna use that in your Zoom sessions with your students. Uh, so once you're in there, uh, it, it should automatically put you on page one. And the fourth icon down on the left hand side is a little sticky note. If you click on that sticky note, then it will bring up a, well, it says sticky note. And you can select different colors if you'd like to. I think it defaults to yellow, but you can pick green or blue or pink or orange. And then you can type a little note there of uh, what brought you here today and then hit save and it will automatically stick it onto the wall there. And we should be able to see it in real time. I'm not seeing any sticky notes yet. <laughs> ah, there I see one and I can drag them around. I will drag them around. Anything that can make things better. I love that. <laughs> A catchy title. So some of you got, you know, the clickbait for the burrito. We will have a drawing at the end and then you'll be able to come to campus and win your, get your prize if, uh, if you win. Already burned out. And I even enjoy imaginary burritos. Uh, I can always learn to improve my classroom environment, looking for inspiration and guidance. It sounded interesting. So here I am for my virtual breakfast burrito to learn about creative approaches our colleagues are using to combat burnout. I can always use some new ideas. I love the subject matter with or without the burritos that is said to be covered. Learn and share with colleagues. Oh, this is wonderful. Wonderful. So we will be using the Jamboard uh, periodically throughout. Oh, let's see, I didn't get a chance to read all of them. Always interested in learning new ideas, always interested in learning maybe how to help my students avoid burnout when they often have full-time jobs, children they care for, and somehow in school. Yeah, our students are amazing. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, the Jamboard will be saved, so we'll be able to look at it in more depth later. Let's go. Sean, Marianne, and I like food. If you haven't figured that out, we named the topic burritos. 
then we got on the jam board. Now we're going to talk about rolling, cinnamon rolls, tootsie rolls, tootsie rolls. Um, but this conversation has evolved uh, back in 2019. Sean and I, I don't know if we went to lunch or coffee or, but we were trying to solve the world's problems. And uh, Sean was catching me up on an issue, a student issue that we were dealing with. And I said, you know, I think sometimes um, student drama can be avoided if we put things in place. And a lot of times faculty aren't given the tools or the resources, or we really didn't provide the information they needed to decrease the probability of student drama. Um, and we had actually, we were gonna make this a flex day presentation and then COVID hit and then other priorities took priority and everything got put on the back burner. Um, and then um, Sherilyn contacted me and Tabitha and I don't know who else, those manager people um, and said that they wanted to um, kind of bring this presentation back to life. And as we started talking, it really wasn't about student discipline. If we peeled back the onion, it really had to do with um, having appropriate classroom behavior because society right now is very divisive if you haven't walked out of your house since the lockdown and um, everybody takes sides on things. And even in the media, we've been taught that it's acceptable behavior to be mean to each other. It's acceptable behavior to disagree uh, disrespectfully. And um, that is not acceptable behavior. And the one thing that we can control is what happens in our, in our classrooms. Um, so we started backing up and realizing that it really wasn't a presentation about student discipline. It's about creating appropriate an environment um, that is structured and learning, um, but still allows students and faculty the ability to express themselves professionally. Um, so, so we want to create an environment that's welcoming, engaging, and structured for learning. And Sean, why don't you tag on to that? Thank you, Lydia. So yeah, we, um, we've had several conversations and Lydia has been a, a virtual instructor for quite some time. So she's been in the virtual environment for years. And um, prior to COVID, her um, issues were somewhat unique um, from a discipline standpoint and, and how you kind of looked at student behavior in the classroom via Canvas uh, or discussion boards or um, what, you know, what is being said to other students uh, through communication tools. So, We've had uh, many conversations on, on, on how do you appropriately uh, deal with and manage uh, certain behaviors that happen in the classroom, which again, kind of blossomed into, uh, well, what are we doing to ensure um, that we've set proper boundaries, that we've set proper expectations, that, that it's clear uh, where the boundaries are and how we um, kind of deal with disagreements in the classroom. But just speaking for myself, I mean, from an equity standpoint, I think it's important um, for us to always examine our own deficit mindedness or biases in, in any situation and, and possibly stop always assuming that the student is wrong um, and that, uh, that I look to see what my part um, in any conflict is. From an enrollment management standpoint, I think our best strategy for enrollment is to um, keep the students we have. Um, and I think one way that we do that is to create that proper um, inviting, engaging environment for students. Um, and again, as Lydia had mentioned, I think there's certain things that we need to consider, especially as we look towards coming back to class is, you know, everything's highly political and we are the ones responsible for our boundaries um, or our environment and boundaries help create that proper learning space. Um, we're in a new uh, classroom, which is different from before. We've been forced in the 21st century. And I think now that we're here, there's an expectation for us to just continue to get better in our virtual spaces. Um, and I believe you know, a properly managed classroom 
um, preserves the integrity, integrity and quality of instruction here. Thank you, Lydia. Okay, very quickly, our goal for today to present some basic information related to creating a welcoming structured learning environment, to share promising practices related to classroom management, to rediscover the joy of positively impacting student lives, and to start an extended conversation on reimagining how Fresno City College delivers quality, equity-minded instruction. Today is the start of that conversation. And it doesn't say anything on there about burnout, but yes, we will also cover burnout. Oh, I guess that's me again. I'm looking in the team site and there was a slide in between, but it looks like we blanked that one out. Okay, so uh, um, what is burnout? Why does it happen and how to over overcome it? This topic all by itself could be two and a half, three hours. Uh, so I, I wanna give you some information to think about and um, some um, tips for things that you can do and we'll start a conversation about that. I'm going to start with a definition of burnout that comes from an article in Inside Higher Ed. Uh, the link is there. I don't know if Susie or someone can put that in the chat if you want to read the. Thank you, Susie, if you would like to read the entire article. Um, so we have this definition of burnout, chronic workplace stress, and I put in italics, exacerbated by institutional decisions out of your control. And boy, COVID did that for us, right? Lots of institutional decisions out of our control, uh, ma uh, vaccine mandates and mask mandates and everything are, that, uh, that came with um, COVID turning our world upside down. So chronic workplace stress exacerbated by institutional decision decisions out of your control, resulting in feelings of energy depletion and exhaustion. This might include feeling overwhelmed, um, difficulty concentrating, just tired. Right? Increased mental distance from one's job or feelings of negativism or cynicism related to one's job. This could look like withdrawing from colleagues, or being very irritable around colleagues in department meetings, loss of faith in students, or an increased feelings of suspicions about student motives. And the last one, reduced professional efficacy. Um, really just feeling like you do not wanna go to work. You don't wanna do the work. Um, not feeling good at one's job, feeling inadequate. This is work burnout. So um, as I was reading that and giving you a few examples, maybe you were checking off some boxes, right? Yeah, I see that in myself. I have been more cynical, more, ne more negative about students, about my job, not wanting to do it, more tired. Uh, so uh, we have a poll that's opened up where you can do a little self-assessment. How burned out are you? Given that definition that I gave, that I just gave you. Zero being not at all, and six being very much. And everything in between. So we'll give you a little bit of time. Looks like right now we have 68% Oops, 70% participation, 75% participation. Wonderful. 82% participation. We have a few holdouts. Few holdouts. Maybe just give them a couple more seconds. It could be that the interpreters don't answer, possibly. Ah, uh, yes, because you're you're counted. 
Okay, I'll go ahead and close the poll now. And so it looks like we have 6% not at all, wonderful. 14% at one, 25% gave themselves a rating of two, 25% also at three, 17% at four, 6% at five, and 8% at very much burnout, right? all the way burnout at six. So it looks like a lot of spread here with uh, the majority at a, at a two, three, four, but some of you are, are really burnt out. So what are we gonna do about that? So some tips for um, a, a overcoming or avoiding burnout. And then we're also gonna give you uh, the opportunity to share some thoughts on a jam board coming up soon. Sean, can you advance the slide? Thank you. So first of all, recognizing the symptoms, right? That was why I read them very slowly. I gave you some examples, some, th some things to really think about with that definition. First is the first step in overcoming burnout is recognizing the, the, the symptoms. And then um, really thinking about setting reasonable expectations for yourself. Um, I, I think particularly when we all went online and, and everyone was really overwhelmed, we were trying to do too much, right? Uh, it, it was a, a, a lot of work all at one time to switch our classes to online and to um, be um, responsive to our student needs during that time. So working on a healthy work-life balance, which includes basic self-care and stepping away from work every day. We can't underestimate the power of basic self-care. That means getting enough rest and eating nourishing foods. And we have beautiful days right now. We need to get outside and get a little sunshine. And uh, it is very easy to be uh, at our computers really all of the time and responding to students all of the time. We need to put on our calendars when we are going to step away from work, right? This is the time that I stop responding to emails, um, that you know, do that, do not disturb and carve out some time in your day for basic self-care and uh, for, for you. Um, right now I'm all about bracketology. So uh, watching a little bit of basketball when I can. Valuing quality work over quantity. So maybe you used to give five big assignments and you only are gonna give three now, right? Quality work over quantity. Saying no to some projects. Again, quality over quantity. So really looking at where you can pare things down, right? Um, and focus on the quality. Um, discuss and celebrate successes with colleagues. One of the big ones of burnout, big, the big symptoms is cynicism. And we can really get into a pissing and moaning session with our colleagues, everything bad that is happening and focusing on the, the, the cheating and the not being prepared for class and all of those things that we do when we uh, stand around the virtual water cooler and complain about our jobs or our burnout or um, all you know, our students. We need to change that conversation and discuss all of the wonderful students that we have and celebrating the successes with our students. That's a mindset change. And it, it means somebody in that group changing the conversation, right? Um, when you're complaining, um, asking, uh, or offering that story about that inspirational student that you had to shift that conversation. And if you could advance the slide, Sean, taking advantage of what the campus has to offer. On February 22nd, it's easy for me to remember that date because it's 222. On February 22nd, this email came out um, 
advertising the campus stress reduction project and they have three events coming up one on march 29th one on april 26th and one on may 10th this is a joint project with our um, msw interns and our psych interns on stress reduction so take advantage of of what the college has to offer and if you need to uh, if you're full-time you can take advantage of the eap the employee assistance program get some professional help if you need it um, oh. Uh, and I, I think that the district office also sent out, they, they will periodically send out some things uh, that we can take advantage of as well. So take advantage of what we have. We're interested to know uh, how you cope with burnout. So what are the things that you are doing to cope with your burnout that we can share with each other? And we have uh, Jamboard page two for that. So go to that same Jamboard session, but at the very top, you can toggle to page two. And I want us to really get real about this. So I put on the page negative and positive coping. Uh, sleep is an interesting one. I don't, don't know quite where to put that because sleep is a positive coping strategy in less you're so exhausted and uh, depressed that all you're doing is sleeping right you know 16 hours a day of sleeping so i'm going to put it kind of in the middle because it depends rest i'm going to put rest over here and i see you moving things around too um, meditation is wonderful extending grace to yourself and your students working out yeah if you can uh, go to the gym or, you know, just work out at home, exercise, go for a walk. I think about how much I value students. That's wonderful. Um, checking my emails less often at night, making intentional time to hang out with friends. Lots of positive stuff. This is wonderful. I see lots of positive, positive stuff. I want us to think about, um, you know, are we drinking? too much alcohol. That's a negative one. Complaining. I saw wine and I thought wine with an H, but yeah, wine or or whining with an H. Overworking. Oh, and yeah, now I see you putting some on the negative side. So when we want to be mindful of the coping strategies that we are using. And if they are counterproductive, they're negative, what can we do instead? All right. So instead of drinking that second glass of wine, what can I do instead? Or maybe instead of drinking the wine at all, I can drink a cup of tea instead. All right. Instead of complaining about my students to with my teacher friends, I can celebrate those students who have been inspirational because we have so many of them so many wonderful stories about our students oh doom scrolling on social media i don't even know what that means but it sounds horrible <laughs> wonderful and and sharing right sharing the positive Okay, let's go ahead and move on. Um, such great sharing. I could just keep reading those for a long time. I know, I know. Um, Wonderful so ideas. What we want to do now is move to the next phase of actually how do we create a welcoming structured learning environment? And I'm going to just um, touch on these topics, what it means to teach, uh, what is quality learning, um, a little bit about student success, and equity. So let's start with the next slide, and that is, why do you teach? Um, we've all sat in interviews, either being interviewed or sitting on the interview committee, and that's one of the first questions we ask, why do you want to teach? And the person lights up, oh, because I want to impact lives, or I get such joy when I see students get the concept, and everybody smiles, and we move on to the next question. And um, how do you really know if people are sincere and if they're not, Sean's playing. Um, 
and we never do know. And I guess the question is, have your priorities changed since you were first hired to teach to now? And how did COVID or switching to online or wearing a mask or any of those, uh, the trauma that we've all been through in the last two years change as well? Um, and, and I guess we just kind of want to go back and reflect what did we do or what changed and what did not change from that first time that we gave that response of why we want to teach. Um, so Sean, we can go to the next slide now. Now, some of you are too young to remember one of my favorite movies, which is Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And uh, Ben Stein plays the part of a really bad teacher not because he's a bad teacher, but because he's a bad teacher, because he's probably boring. He sits there and he takes role, not knowing the students. And he's just looking around, Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. And he'll ask a question and he'll say, anyone, 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 anyone. And you can see all the students just kind of falling asleep, falling asleep. Um, in management, when I teach my students, I always ask them, what, who was your worst boss ever? And what is it that made them so awful? Because we can get great lessons from our worst bosses, as well as we can get great lessons from our best bosses. Same goes for a teacher. If I asked you right now to think back of a teacher that really impacted your life, I bet you something will come to mind, some person really quick. Maybe it was K-12, maybe it was in college, and maybe it's now that there's a teacher that is inspiring you. Um, and if I ask you who your worst teacher was, I bet you that'll come to mind before your best teacher sometimes, which is unfortunate. Um, but Sean, can you pull down a few more of those slides? Um, the good teachers are the ones that um, expand your thinking. They, they, they have you question. I tell my students, just because I'm telling you this doesn't mean it's true. Just because you read it on the internet doesn't mean it's true. Um, it's your job to explore. And that's the beauty of being on a college campus is that we're here to stimulate thinking. And before I go any further, I always like to repeat what Mary Ann says. There's no one best way. There's a lot of different variables. And as we start getting into some of these different approaches um, to teaching, um, there's a lot of different variables on, on our class pedagogy and um, whether it's online or hybrid or face-to-face -face or what the discipline is, um, what the way that we have our classroom structured. Um, but the good teachers are the ones that made you feel like you mattered. They, they made you feel valued and they challenged you to think and they also challenged you to respectfully disagree during discussions because I don't think and believe the same of my students, just like I don't think and believe the same as my colleagues. But we have to have that conversation where we can learn from each other. Um, Sean, can you put the next little clicky there? Thank you, because we need to make everybody feel valued. Um, let's go to the next slide, if we can, please. Uh, one of the concepts, if anybody studied management, is quality. And quality is a predetermined standard of what we want the outcome to be. And before we, um, before we uh, finish something, we go back and we say, okay, did we meet this criteria? So if I asked all of you, is this a quality presentation? Some of you are gonna say no, because they promised me a burrito and I didn't get one, or, uh, yes, because Mary Ann's really smart and I like to hear her do the psychology stuff or yeah, because Sean's always screwing around with the slides and other people say no, because Sean's always screwing around with the slides or no, because they didn't feed us burritos and because everybody has a different definition of quality. But as the instructor, you need to go back and ask yourself, how do I know if this is a quality a quality class or quality semester. And we have predetermined criteria that we have to do, which are those lovely SLOs and following the course outline of record. Um, some people will look at, I know the campus has their definition. I'm gonna get that in a minute um, with student success. 
you know, it, if we have a certain number of students uh, passing with a certain GPA or what are our retention? And if you really wanna be bold, you break it down further and you look at your success and retention rates by race or gender or age. Um, other people will say, um, I am successful in the classroom if my students get employed or if my students transfer to university. Um, personally, I think I have a successful semester when I have no drama. Um, either uh, disruptive students or it, this last, I just finished my first nine weeks, I had two students that just had some really awful hardship. And, and it had nothing to do with bad behavior. It was just awful things that occurred to them. And it was a lot of work just trying to make sure that they were okay mentally. Um, some, some faculty members determine success because they wanna be Facebook friends with the students afterwards, or they're, they're looking at their rate my, my professor ratings. But I challenge you to look at what is your criteria? How do you know when your class is a quality class? And then how do you go back and you, how do you measure that? Because after each class, I have a little um, document that I keep for that semester. And I look back and I say, okay, what could I have done better? What improvements can I make to my syllabus? What uh, um, discussions or uh, assignments do need modifications? Did I put some kind of announcement or communication that I got a good response from, from the students or that I got an awful response from, from the students, or I got no response from the students. So go back and keep looking at um, how do you keep improving your quality each semester. So, Mr. Henderson, thank you. So um, we were talking, uh, Sean, Marianne, and I about student success and how do we define student success? And I've come to the conclusion that nobody can clearly define student success because I asked a couple of managers and administrators, I looked on the state chancellor website um, and everybody has different definitions of student success. And even the other two people giving me these snarky looks on the screen um, have different definitions of student success. But we have to remember that student success is not just looking at data. And, and uh, I'm a data-driven person but there's so much more than just defining student success by data. Um, some students come to school to learn uh, job skills, just transferable skills. Some students um, come to get a promotion. Some students come for the grade and the grade isn't necessarily an A grade. They're just happy with a C. I'm starting a back nine week. And one of the questions I asked, why are you here? One of them said, I will be happy if I get a C in this class. That's all I want. It's like, well, okay, let's shoot for a B, but they, they're happy with the C. Some students are first generation and they're just making their family proud that they made it to a college campus. Some students want a sense of belonging. People are here for different reasons and we have to not put all of our students in one bucket and make blank assumptions or, or broad assumptions about them and why they're here. So um, again, go back to student success. One slide I did find in my research was from the RP group and um, they had a great definition. What they did was they surveyed a lot of students and they pulled together um, and asked students, what is it that you, what do you feel makes you successful on a college campus? And I really like this slide and I know I've got a lot of text on here, but I just want to make sure that, um, that you understand and that it's got a little meaning. So these students said that they were most successful if they were directed, focused, nurtured, engaged, connected, and valued. First of all, they were directed, meaning that the students had a goal and they knew how to achieve it. And I was reading that, I thought, wow, what a great opportunity and a reminder of the importance of pathways. Because as an instructor, um, you know, students taking my class, checking off a box, but I need to provide them extra detail about where that box takes them to other majors or certificates or awards or careers that that one class can start leading them toward. So what I do, and in fact, on Curriculum it's really easy is I cut and paste that class and how that class fits into a lot of different awards or degrees and then jobs that they can secure 
from that pathway. Um, again, students want to have a goal and know how to achieve it. And sometimes I don't think they're aware of all the opportunities just from taking your one class. Um, the next factor was being focused, keeping students on track, reminding them. And, and again, as an instructor, are you giving your students timely feedback? Uh, feedback even just especially the first few weeks of class because that's when the student decides whether they're going to like the class or whether they're going to stay in class. Um, so it's again giving them timely feedback. The third factor is um, making the students feel that somebody wants them to succeed and helps them succeed. And nurtured is kind of a, man, I can hear some of my colleagues like I'm not their mother, but it, nurture is the term that they use. They want it to feel like they belong. And um, we're gonna get into a slide when Marianne and I uh, and Sean have a conversation in a bit. Um, about what is the responsibility of the instructor. And all I can say is um, when a student comes to me and they need counseling, or when a student comes to me and they need health services or food or tutoring, um, I'm not the expert in a lot of those areas, in none of those areas, uh, but we have some really great resources. So I can nurture my students by directing them to the resources that are here on campus. The next one is making students feel engaged, um, having them actively participate in class and extra extracurricular activities. We've been locked in our homes for so long. Um, at first it was kind of nice, but then it was like, I need some human interaction. And um, for those of you that teach online, it's a little more of a challenge, uh, but try to find how can you create a sense of community and get your students engaged and provide them opportunities to connect with other students both in and out of the classroom. And then the last one, and I'm always a fan of this one, is just making people feel valued. Um, everybody's got unique skills, talents, abilities, and experience, and we all just want to be recognized. We all want to feel that we matter. Um, and you matter. And I'm just really thankful that you're here and you've joined us this morning. And if I had burritos, I'd feed them to you. Maybe we could blame Dawn for not giving us burritos. Goldsmith would have done it like that. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Next slide, please. What? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <laughs> so um, we're going to be talking a little more about student equity. Um, and we'll be getting into a lot more detail on this. But put yourself in, in the shoes of a student that has never attended college before, or a student that um, has gone through life kind of feeling like they were always the D, the C student, or they didn't belong. Um, again, it's within that first week that the student decides, and probably even with your pre-class communications, whether they decide they are gonna make the class and what their attitude is gonna to be towards you. Um, and think about how your syllabus reads from the perspective of the student. It, does it make them feel welcome? Does it make them feel like they are part of, uh, like they belong on campus, like they belong in your class? I had one instructor, or not an instructor, a mentor. He literally, one of the first things he told me was I spend my first three weeks trying to get students to drop my class. I thought, wow, clearly this guy was just in it for the stipend. And I said, why would you do that? He said, because students are going to drop and I don't want to waste my time grading papers. So I don't grade any papers until about three or four weeks into class, because if not, I'm just wasting my time. And I just thought something's not right about that. Really? Um, so just kind of go back and look at what is the classroom vibe that you're communicating to your students? What kind of environment are you um, showing them? No matter what your discipline is, do you truly care about them? Are you concerned for their success? What kind of resources are you providing them? And again, it goes back to what is your mindset? Because it's the difference between classroom management and creating a classroom community. 
Um, and that means that you're constantly giving them feedback and encouragement because we want to know how we're doing. Think about when we're in the classroom. Uh, one of my deans, the, my dean that hired me, used to give me, gosh, once a week, I would walk into my office and she would have a little sticky note and she'd say, hey, good job. Or, you know, I heard some students talking about you in the classroom and, you know, I was in a meeting and your name popped up. And I have been teaching at City College now, I'm working on year 23, and I still have the sticky note she left me in my desk because it made me feel valued. It made me feel like I was making a difference. And we want, we want our students to feel that way, don't we? Because it means so much to us. So um, anyway, I want to hand off this slide to Marianne because she's just done a phenomenal job in every time we say student equity everybody gets all their own different ideas here and this is just such a great slide to talk about the difference between student equity and equality so go ahead Mav. yeah I I think that a lot of people have seen a similar image to this one but usually the images the image has three people and uh, one one is a, a short person and a medium sized size person and a tall person and of course the short person needs more boxes and and what I like about this particular image is that we have the person in the wheelchair we could give them all boxes right and equality is an assumption of sameness that giving everyone the same thing uh, is uh, is equal and fair, right? That idea, that assumption of sameness, and that we need to treat everybody the same in order to be fair. But giving everyone the same thing only works if everyone has the same needs. And typically, again, you see this with just boxes, and one person needs two boxes, and one person needs three boxes, and one person doesn't need a box at all. Here you're seeing it's not just about boxes. The person in the wheelchair needs something completely different, needs a ramp. And that's fairness, providing support based on differing needs for equal opportunity, right? The, in this particular image, it's the equal opportunity to view the, the soccer game. And the person in the wheelchair needs something completely different. And uh, so I, I like this particular image uh, as a equality versus equity. I do want to also though be mindful that this image is um, kind of very literal. We're not seeing the barriers that students have that you can't necessarily see like food insecurity and housing insecurity and uh, racism, sexism, ableism, xenophobia, right? All, all of those things that get in the way. And, and so those students have other needs that need to be met as well in order, us for, in order for us to achieve fairness, which is the goal. Oh, it looks like we have Jamboard page three. So Jamboard page three, share methods that you use to help students feel they belong. And while you're doing that, I, I want to hijack a little bit and tell a, a really quick story. I had a student tell me that the only reason that she was still in her, and I'm not going to out the other department, but it was another class that she was in. And she told me the only reason she's still in that class is because I make her feel like she belongs in college and that she can pass all of her classes because that instructor, she said on a regular basis, makes everyone in that class feel like they don't belong because he says things like, only a third of you are gonna pass this class. So some of you um, aren't ready for this class. You're you're not gonna you're not gonna pass this class. And she said she just always felt that message, and she always felt like he was kind of talking to her, like it was directed to her. And she would 
sit in that class. And this is what she told me. I, I think Dr. Valentino believes I can pass this class. So I'm not going to listen to him. I'm going to listen to her in my head. And she passed that class. Is everybody jamming? Marianne and mute. Marianne, unmute. Thank you, Lydia. Mine is the orange one. I include a video on imposter syndrome in my syllabus, and I get students all the time thanking me for that video because they identify with imposter syndrome. Constant feedback on assignments, as well as sending encouragements through Canvas and Starfish, uh, accommodating personal issues so the students who are willing to do their work can get credit for it. Yeah, deadlines are an interesting topic. Uh, you know, where, where is the fairness in the student who turns something in five hours late earning a zero on it. Um, you know, it, it was that, that deadline really important for that particular assignment. Uh, but that's a whole nother topic. Um, highlighting students work each week as exemplary. Yeah, that's important for the student who is highlighted as exemplary and for the other students who now have something to like uh, calibrate to and understand what to shoot for, sharing my personal story. Yes, really connecting to students. And it's interesting um, what they connect to because uh, I, I am a first generation college student and I include that in my bio. And I had a student come to my office um, who, who told me that was what she connected to even though everything else about our lives was so different. She was a dream student and uh, uh, just everything was very different about our stories. But she said, you were first generation and I, I wanna know what you did to feel like you um, were ready for college. And so we had a conversation about that. I actually ended up walking her to the Dream Center and getting her connected there too. Uh, so you, you never know what you're gonna say that's gonna connect. Um, I share my favorite color. Sometimes students come up, yeah, purple's my favorite color too. So it's very interesting. Um, reaching out to students that failed the course to encourage them to retake the course because they can succeed. I love that one because when, when Lydia was talking about what's success, sometimes failing the class but coming back the next semester is a success, right? Do they feel like they can come back and do, do it the next time? That's a success. If they're back in my class the next time. When possible, allowing students to guide discussion topics. Yeah, empowering our students. I share my own zigzagged and delayed higher ed experience. Very powerful to, to, to share our experiences. Lots of good stuff coming in. Positive reinforcement when they speak or contribute an idea, allow them to see how I appreciate their input. I found myself uh, getting more um, in. Um, I don't like the word intrusive, but a little bit more intrusive in my classes, uh, inviting students to move. I never used to do that. If they wanted to sit in the back, I let them sit in the back. And uh, now if there's room in the front, I will invite them to move. And they're typically really compliant and they move. And sometimes you can see a real shift in just uh, their body language and um, that you that you validated that you wanted them in the room by asking them, why, you know, you're sitting way off in the corner all by yourself. Let's move and don't move them to the front. You know, that's intimidating, but 
they can still be in the back, but in the middle instead of way off to the side. And it's a little outside of my comfort zone to do that kind of thing, to force students into groups, uh, you know, not allow them to be by them. I used to, if you don't feel comfortable being in a group for this discussion, it's okay that you write on your own. I don't do that anymore, much more intrusive. And it's made a big difference. Really good ideas there. And you will have access to the Jamboard later if you want to go back and read those. But I think maybe Lydia wants to move on. <laughs> oh, it's me again. Let me get out of the Jamboard. So what I wanted to say here is to kind of circle back to burnout because burnout increases cynicism and cynicism is the opposite of trust. And I strive to trust that my students are doing the best they can and to approach conflict with empathy. So if there's conflict that happens, uh, a student who uh, is arguing with me, right, or has a kind of an attitude, right, with me, I'm thinking about what's going on with that student, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna lean in, and I'm gonna ask, uh, how how are you? Like, what's going on? Help me understand. Help me understand why you feel the need to, why you felt the need to attack me right now, because I felt attacked. I'm, I'm feeling hurt right now. Let's talk about what's happening between us. Um, so approaching conflict with empathy and trusting rather than being negative and cynical that, about their motives. So I strive to establish norms from the first day of class to help all of us engage in respectful discord. So I'll, I'll give you a, an example of a syllabus statement that I have. So it goes like this, uh, our social identities, which include our race, ethnicity, nationality, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, spirituality, socioeconomic status, disability, et cetera, influence our experiences and our interactions with others. These differences provide rich opportunities to learn from each other's unique perspective and lived experiences. They also provide the opportunity for misunderstandings and hurt feelings. When this happens, when this happens, we will use it as an opportunity for discussion and personal growth. And then I remind students of these norms frequently and before engaging in contentious conversations. So if something is happening in the room and things are getting contentious, I will we'll stop it, right? And say, let's remember our norms that we, all, we have different experiences, we have differing opinions, and this is gonna maybe cause some hurt feelings, some misunderstandings, and that's okay. We can all have our own opinions. We're, um, we're going to use this as an opportunity to learn from each other. Okay, I know you all want to say it, so <laughs> go ahead, <Sean>. Norm! <laughs> so speaking we're of did, We're dating norms. ourselves again, because some of them are like, who the heck is Norm? <laughs> Speaking of class norms, um, again, back up and look at life through your students' eyes and don't make assumptions about them. I've taught online for so long, I just think everybody knows Canvas. Everybody knows how to log in. Everybody knows how to buy the book through the bookstore. If it says it's at the bookstore, Get on the website and look at the bookstore link. What's the problem? And, and you need to back up. If students have never been to campus before, or as Sean likes to remind us, we have instructors teaching 50 million different ways. It's hard for a student to switch from class to class and remember which student does things which way. 
So try to make it as easy as possible for students and don't make the assumption that they do know how to log into Canvas on your welcome message or that they do know to look on the bookstore website because um, one student I remember a couple of years ago, I said, you know, she said, well, where do I get the book? I said, you get it at the bookstore. She said, I called Barnes and Noble and they said I would have to order it and it would take, and I was like, no, the, the school bookstore. And I was like, it never occurred to me when I used generic bookstore that they were trying to buy it at a bookstore. So we can't make assumptions about students that have never been on a college campus before. Um, also, whenever um, there is drama, they taught me this at interim dean school. Um, the first thing when there is drama and a student comes to you with a complaint about an instructor, we pull out the course syllabus. And I'll ask the instructor, what does your syllabus say? And my dean always asks me, what does your syllabus say? Although now I just send them an email with a copy of my syllabus statement so that there's no drama. Um, and when a student is complaining about something, I'll say, what does the syllabus say? And um, I have a friend and she has a shirt and it says, read the syllabus. And yesterday when we were having a conversation, Marianne said it about 50 times, read the syllabus, <laughs> read the syllabus. And we all, we can say, read the syllabus, just like we say norm. It's just ingrained in us, but I challenge you to go back and make sure that your syllabus statements say what you want them to say, even the difference between may and must, because there's a big difference. And when issues escalate and they make it to Sean, the first thing Sean says is, Sean, I'm you. What do you say? Let's see the syllabus, please. <laughs> and he usually does say please. Um, but when you look at your syllabus, make sure that you have equity-minded policies. And um, Mav, I don't know if you wanna make a quick comment about equity-minded policies. We're gonna be talking about that on the next slide, um, but make a comment on equity-minded policies, please. Sure. Uh, I, I just think that whenever we are writing a policy, first of all, I think we need to be mindful that we're not writing a policy because of that one student that we had a horrible interaction with that it, 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 our, our policy shouldn't be dictated, dictated through that. And our policy, we need to think about uh, the consequence of the policy. So will this policy have a disproportionate impact on certain groups over others? That's a, kind of a litmus, litmus test for the policy. Okay. Um, also, um, in your student communications, um, Marianne was saying something and I just went blank on it, but I'm sure it'll come back to me. This is what happens when you get old. Um, but make sure that your student communications are, are um, oh, that's what my statement was, or my thought was. In my policies, um, when I have deadlines that aren't logical to some people, I have it in my syllabus about why I have that policy. I, I require your first discussion post to be made by blah, blah, blah time because blah, 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 blah. Or later on, this is the deadline, but I recommend you have it at this time because blah, 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 blah. Explain to your students and even in your student communications so that they have an understanding. Our job, especially in business, you know, I'm the hardcore HR person. Um, I'm preparing them to succeed in the workplace. And um, for that reason, they need to understand why there are certain things in place. If I just feel like sleeping in that day, that's just not going to cut it. It's not going to work. Um, so, so the communications really matter. Uh, like I said, I just started a, a nine week class and I've got two students that are not looking like they're going to make it. And I sent them message after message saying, you know, performance concern, you know, are you there? Please respond. Are you okay? Trying to get them to answer. But 
That also means, and I put, I care about your academic success. Please reach out to me. But at the same time, it's our classroom and we need to make sure that we manage that classroom appropriately. And that's why we have to set boundaries about what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior. So going back to the whole reason we were asked to present today, if there is student discourse, we need to upfront and even in our syllabus and in our own communications with our students and how they see us modeling appropriate behavior with other faculty members around us, with classified professionals, with our administrators, with anybody, how are we handling um, respectful conversations where we're not talking down about other people with whom we don't agree, where we're not um, you know, engaging in political discussions that are allowing people, creating more division instead of trying to help people understand different perspectives. So we need to make sure that we're setting the parameters about engaging in these conversations, but having them in respectful conversations. Um, so there are times though where faculty need to involve other areas, but before we do, um, I want to take a little minute and have a conversation with Marianne and Sean about some issues. Um, I like to call them the elephant in the room. And when I was talking to different faculty members about this presentation, um, and I got some interesting comments, but I think they're very real comments, they're very honest comments. So um, I'll kind of read them and then I'll let Marianne or Sean answer them. Um, and the first one was, and by the way, full disclosure, none of these came from the business division. So don't start thinking, oh, that's so-and-so, that's so-and-so. None of these came from the business division. So don't always blame business for things. We have good people. So the first thing someone told me, I'm getting ready to retire. It's too late to change. It takes work to modify your syllabus or to you know, make things equity minded. So uh, Marianne, don't answer the equity minded part because we're gonna get that in a minute. But how would you respond when someone said, I'm getting ready to retire, it's too late to change? Well, I'm a psychologist, so it's never too late to change. <laughs> don't you love her? Never too late to change. I'm glad I roped you in. And, and the most constant thing in life is change. And change can be exciting and challenging. So you know, let's talk about uh, positive change. Okay. Sean, did you want to give them your, no, your response when you heard that? Okay. <laughs> so um, another person told me when I said we were going to originally make this about student discipline, um, one person said, why even report? Well, that's a good one. And, and I've heard that uh, a lot in my time. And, and here's why. It's a professional courtesy as much as anything. Um, and it's just a part of maintaining the boundaries within your classroom. But if a student is, is not behaving appropriately in your classroom, there's a very good likelihood that it's happening in someone else's as well. So reporting, or at least having the conversation with your own dean um, and, and getting the consultation on what you should do next, but um, not doing anything uh, about it shouldn't be the answer. Okay. Another comment I got was my dean won't support me. Um, and I'll answer that one first and then let any of you um, chime in. And I have two answers because one answer is um, technically, if there is a student uh, behavior issue, it doesn't involve the dean. It goes, and Sean's going to show us the system, but it goes from the faculty member to student services. Now, as a courtesy, and because every student will go straight to the dean, you need to keep your dean involved. And um, my dean, I will always send him an email, even just in my gut. If I feel like there's a student and it's just the probability of something might not be going right with that student, I'll email my dean and I'll say, just a heads up, I've got this student, here's what's happened. 
I'm keeping an eye on it, but don't be shocked if he shows up in your office and here's what my syllabus statement is. And he'll say, thank you. Um, deans, it's hard for a dean to support you when you don't have anything documented, when you don't have a syllabus statement to back things up. And um, deans don't pick sides. Deans just are trying to help resolve the conflict. And again, it goes back to what is your syllabus and what have you done and one of the first things that both my dean and Sean, and when a student comes to me about another instructor, the first thing I say is, have you talked to the student? So Sean, you wanna chime in? Oh, um, to answer the bullet, my dean won't support me. Um, I, I will do my best to support you. Uh, I, and I'm always available for consultation when it comes to um, how to handle situations in your classroom. Um, I forgot the second part. <laughs> I'm old and I'm nervous. <laughs> um, no, the first question I ask every student uh, when we have a meeting scheduled is, do you know why we're meeting today? Um, and unfortunately, 25% of the students that I've seen over the years have no idea why they've been referred to see me. And it takes um, a good amount of time to kind of catch them up and, and inform them uh, what has happened and why they're here. Um, but for the most part, students do know why. Um, but that is the question that I ask is, are you even aware? Um, so, uh, and, and then we'll get into this when we talk about concerning behavior versus disruptive behavior, but it's always uh, appropriate to look a student in the eye and ask them if they're okay. It, communication is so key. And I was reading somebody in the chat said, there are so many great tools in Canvas now that makes it really easy to communicate with students and do it efficient, efficiently. So very good. So Sean, don't take this next one personal, but it, uh, one of the comments said it takes student services too long to respond. Guilty. Next. I'm kidding. <laughs> no. So, um, when a referral comes to our office, whether it be for academic dishonesty or disruptive behavior, the first thing we do is contact the student. Um, we are unable to complete the loop until the student responds. And sometimes they don't. When that occurs, there's a hold that's placed on their, um, their student record, which prevents them from registering for the next semester um, until they come resolve the issue. That could be months, depending on when it occurred or whether we've had uh, times where students have um, had an issue in their last semester here um, and transferred and, and have gone to another uh, institution, um, somehow have come back years later because there's one course they need to take and they can't register because that old is there. Um, but it took years for that to occur. Um, and, and then some instances, you, you, may not, um, you may not receive the resolution, um, depending on uh, what privacy rights the student may have in, in that situation. So um, I appreciate the bullet. Um, I wish it wasn't true, um, but I, yes, I don't take I, it personally. Can I uh, ask you one question? Uh, because I know this happened to a faculty member they had a dishonesty infraction like the week before the end of final or class, or it may have occurred during finals, I'm trying to recall, but they assigned a grade with this dishonesty infraction floating out there. And because they assigned a grade, um, that student ended up getting the grade they had before the dishonesty infraction. Does that make sense? And my question is, what would an instructor do if the last two weeks of class, including finals, there was a dishonesty infraction, do they assign the grade or do they not assign a grade? What do they do? Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm trying to imagine that situation in my head. Um, what is appropriate anytime that dishonesty is, is alleged or believed to have occurred is to assign a zero for that assignment and then um, work through the process. So, that is the appropriate, and unfortunately, if it's a final and the final is worth uh, uh, quite a bit of their grade and they receive a zero, it automatically fails them in the course. Um, 
this is where consultation is is appropriate. Um, having I'm I'm always happy to have that conversation with you to kind of work through um, the situation, all of the different um, little layers that might be involved with it. Um, but ultimately, assignment of grade is is the faculty's purview. Um, okay, Michael Gilbert. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say One person in the chat said, "Wouldn't I be appropriate for that situation?" Ooh, possibly uh, if it took if 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 it was going to take some amount of time for an investigation to occur to get to kind of get to the bottom and resolve it, possibly. Um, but if 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 the evidence is 100% conclusive that the student has, has been dishonest, then the grade will most likely be a zero for that assignment. And the, uh, however that calculates into their final grade. Um, okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's go to the next one. And then we'll see Marianne Boyle. Cheaters are going to cheat. So why even do something? So my, uh, when, when Lydia first showed us this slide, I had a visceral reaction to that line. And my reaction is in using cheater as a noun. So the student is a cheater as opposed to cheating as a behavior. Because cheating as a behavior, I can intervene with that student and have a conversation with that student about that behavior, what motivated that behavior. Because sometimes what motivates cheating behavior is overwhelm, it's stress. It, you know, and when you have a conversation with that student, all of that comes out and it's about stress management and it's about all of these things that are happening in their life that motivated that cheating behavior. So that, that cheater, labeling them as a cheater puts them in this, in this very negative box. And now as an instructor, if I'm seeing them as a cheater, this noun um, that sets up a, a very negative relationship in my ability to have a, um, a positive impact on that student. Okay, thank you. Um, so this next one is uh, gets really emotional for people and I've gotten this response from several faculty members. And one of them was a, a male that got pretty teary-eyed. Um, if students fall under certain categories in the name of equity, they should receive exceptions. And one faculty member said, um, I am a white male and let's assume there was a black female that was blatantly behaving dishonestly and I report her I am suddenly labeled a racist. I, I'm, uh, you know, it, it could ruin my career because everybody's so divisive about things. And he said, it's just not worth it anymore because I'm gonna be labeled and stereotyped and I, I can lose my career. I would invite that instructor to join the RAM Racial Equity Lab so that we can really talk about what racial equity means and how to address it in the classroom and how to um, navigate through those challenges. And they are challenges. I mean, I, um, they are challenges. Last mm -hmm. semester, and Sean and I were having that conversation yesterday that somebody accuses you of being race, racist. That's like the most hurtful thing they can say. And um, I think it's part of what's going on in society right now to divide us instead of bring us together. And I, I strongly encourage anybody that's um, in attendance today that has not signed up for the RAM Racial Equity Lab to do it. It's it's so enlightening and it's really valuable. Um, so we can work through those issues. And Marianne, um, at the end, we'll put, um, we're gonna put our email addresses up, but Marianne invites anybody that feels that way with that one bullet to confidentially go to her, email her and she can meet with you and um, she's got a good vault. She locks things in the vault. And um, 
then you can share some things with her. I do. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. thank you for saying that, Lydia, because not everybody has the the top, the ability to um, for the time commitment for the Ram Racial Equity Lab. And um, one of the complaints about it, if you will, is that I'm preaching to the choir. I really invite people to have a conversation, a confidential conversation with me about these kinds of issues. Uh, even if it's just a you know 30 minute, well, let's talk about what's going on there with you that you're feeling um, defeated and like, like you've sort of given up, I can't even engage in, in this because of fear. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about how to navigate that. Um, I noticed in the chat, um, both uh, Sherilyn and Susie posted information for Cora training also. Um, if you have not been through Cora training and you don't have time for the um, um, racial equity lab here on campus, Cora is kind of self-paced and um, it's a good foundation to address some, um, some of these equity concerns, at least give you a good introduction to start applying them to your um, pedagogy. So the last bullet here is counseling, food, outside activities. That is not my job. My job is to teach HR, not my job. How would you respond? Do I get that one? Yeah. All right, so I have a few thoughts about this one, um, especially being a, a person who's been um, involved in student engagement since their career. Um, for me, this is a lot about access. You know, it's it's in what I was thinking about this morning as I'm, I'm kind of going through our presentation in my head and getting ready is, is you know, we, we plant seeds and we want them to grow and learning is kind of that growth of the seed, but you can't just only put water on it. You have to tend to it. Um, occasionally you have to pull weeds. Every now and again, you have to snip um, branches. Uh, some need to be in the sunlight, some need, prefer shade. Um, but uh, it, it's, all of these things and in, in to, to achieve the growth that, that we are seeking and um, what we have promised our community. Um, I also think it's about access. Access is more than just registering for a class. It's making content um, available, accessible and engaging students in the learning actively. Um, so I, I would believe that it, all of it is a part of our job um, and uh, as Lydia has mentioned, there are a lot of resources on campus that can um, assist with any of these. So if you need help, um, ask and help will be there and, and hopefully through the pathway. I would add it is my job, like this sort of big overarching uh, part of my job is to increase the social mobility of our students to have an, a, an effect on our, our Fresno, greater Fresno and our region, um, our economy through helping our students with their social mobility, right? To get better jobs. And it's the students that have the, all of those like basic needs. So food insecurity, housing insecurity, those students that need those interventions that is going to make the most impact on our community and so if our job if we think of our job as us to educate the students who um uh, their their only need is for us to 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 help them through the learning process right and they're ready for that and they they can do the homework and navigate canvas and all of that stuff um, it, those students are going to do fine, right? It's the, it's the ones that have all of those other needs that if I don't do something for them, then I'm really not meeting the mission and the vision and the values of Fresno City College. Um, 
I like to think of when I look at all of these concerns, um, my classroom is like my own little, little corner of the world. And if I say that um, being mean to each other or not caring if you have food or clothing or not caring that you're failing the class or letting you cheat, uh, um, that means it's acceptable behavior. And then they're gonna go out and say, well, then this is all okay on campus. Well, then if it's okay on campus, it's okay out in the community. And if it's okay in the community, look at our world. Um, I have a resource list that I pulled together. And if anybody um, wants a copy of mine, you can use it as a foundation. It's not perfect and you know, do what you want with it. But I post it on Canvas and I also attach it to my syllabus. Um, and it's just a list. Fresno City College has so many incredible resources. The student services just kicks butt in that area of all these different resources. And I pulled together a list. So if anybody wants a copy, um, email me after the presentation and give me at least an hour a day to get back to you. And I'll send you a copy of that document because I have homework from Ramriel. I got to cram out. So, okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so we, we've talked about, uh, a lot about our, our part in creating that uh, welcoming, engaging learning environment that, that seeks to meet the needs of the students. Um, there are times where uh, those techniques don't always work and we do have real um, problem or a real incident of uh, cheating or dishonesty, plagiarism or disruptive behavior. So just to talk a little bit about our discipline process at Fresno City College, um, the main purpose is to maintain a safe learning environment, uh, a safe learning uh, appropriate environment. Um, and that is uh, more often than not, our office uh, working with you to reinforce the policies or the boundaries that are set in your classroom. Um, there is a, uh, if you, if you wanna know the formal rules at FCC for student behavior, um, it's in ARs or BPs 5500. Um, and that will um, delineate all the causes for discipline. Uh, next. So again, when there's trouble, the, the common reasons that students are referred to our office are for dishonesty infractions, for disruptive behavior, or for, for care issues, which are wellness or health um, related issues. Um, some common errors, and, and uh, this goes back to the many conversations Lydia and I have had um, over incidents in her classroom, um, are some of the mistakes that we make um, in, in, in kind of working through for a resolution. A lot of times there may be uh, uh, very unclear policies or, or the enforcement is, is not clear. Um, lack of consistent reporting, which allows for someone to say, well, so-and-so did it and didn't get in trouble, but I did. Um, lack of documentation, no evidence uh, to support an allegation uh, makes it difficult to um, reinforce the policies within the class. And then when we become emotional, um, and, and you would think this would happen more with behavior, but um, quite honestly, I, it, it plagiarism um, really irritates faculty. Um, and, and, it, and it can leave the place of, of rational and let's just uh, figure out what's going on uh, with the student and, and asking them, why did you think this was a good idea? Um, to creating a, an us versus them um, kind of mentality. So those are just some of the common errors that are made um, in reporting and just wanted to point those out. We do have a process for uh, reporting student behavior. Um, Lydia uh, encourages you all to uh, take out your cell phones and snap a a photo of this, although we can probably get this on the website uh, here pretty quickly. This flowchart was developed um, 
with, yeah, with the group of uh, instructional deans and members of academic senate and really talking about you know how do we how do we look at our processes um, at, through a, a lens of equity and one that you know works to to build the student not tear the student apart um, and it just provides um, basic instruction on on how to move through the process so first we'll talk about allegations of dishonesty um, you can see in the flow chart that there's suspected cheating or plagiarism if it's the first incident um, we encourage you to meet with the student kind of right away uh, inform them of the dishonesty that is alleged to have occurred uh, provide the evidence that you have to support the allegation including copies of your syllabus statements and let the student know that they will receive a zero. Now, the zero is up to you. Um, some faculty have allowed students to uh, redo an assignment after having the conversation and hearing about the situation um, the student was in when the cheating occurred. Um, so again, assignment of grade is up to the faculty and discretion is yours. Um, but when you review the ARs and the BPs, you'll notice the word repeated in most of the behavior um, bullets. That word alone um, leads us to believe that a, a student should have the ability to correct the behavior before it becomes a formal discipline. Um, and then we'll know that if the behavior continues that it, it is uh, a referral is definitely warranted to the Dean of Students office. So you see there, document your meeting with the student and inform your pathway Dean of the resolution. Many faculty say a quick email like Lydia had said, you know, an incident occurred, I met with the student, I want to keep it on the radar, I shoot an email to my dean just saying, hey, I want you to be aware. Uh, that also works as documentation and evidence should another incident occur and, and it goes through the formal process of reporting. So now let's talk about allegations of disruptive behavior. Again, um, you're going to want to meet with the student to discuss the behavior. You're going to want to provide some examples of what the appropriate behavior would be in those situations. And then again, document the meeting. If the behavior continues, a referral to the Dean of Students Office is definitely warranted. Um, and then uh, what we'll talk about right here with concerning behavior. With both concerning behavior and extreme disruptive behavior, um, where you believe that there is a threat to uh, the students um, self or others, please call Campus PD. Uh, the number is right there, it's 244-5911. You also have um, the uh, panic button on your phone. It should be the bottom button um, on your uh, telephone and it should say SCCD PD. Um, and if you have a situation where you really just can't uh, talk, you press the button, they will listen and they will come and assist. Um, but those are for extreme situations where there is um, a, a very high likelihood that harm is about to occur. Concerning behavior is different from disruptive behavior. Disruptive behavior could be intentional, um, uh, you know, uh, just being defiant, um, yelling, shouting, uh, name calling, um, those are disruptive behaviors in the classroom. Concerning behavior really focuses more on a student's wellness. Um, so if a student happens to be exhibiting odd behavior that you, you do not see as an, an immediate emergency, you might want to consult with your pathway dean and, and if it's appropriate, talk to the student, ask them if they're okay. Again, there are referrals on campus or services on campus that can help students. Um, and if the student requests help, you can refer them. Um, it would be best if you walk them over. Um, and I suggest going to our nurses first. It, it seems to be a lot easier uh, to get a student to agree to go see the nurse than it is to get them to go to psych services. Um, psychological services and our college nurses work very close together um, to deal with students' health and wellness. So uh, if you are able to make the referral to um, those two places, uh, there's a high likelihood that a student may go to the nurse with you. Um, but if the student refuses assistance and continues to exhibit, you know, this concerning or odd behavior, 
we would then ask you to report it formally. And I'm gonna show you the process right now. So when you go to the main Fresno City College website and you click the tab that says faculty and staff up the top and you scroll down, you'll see the quick links. Under the common links, the second um, bullet is behavior report form. When you click that form, the incident reporting form shows up. The first thing it's gonna ask you is, you know, what type of incident are you reporting? Is this dishonesty? Is this disruptive behavior? Or is it concerning behavior? Um, dishonesty infractions and disruptive behavior uh, allegations go directly to the Dean of Students Office. And we contact the student immediately to set an appointment and work towards a resolution. Concerning behavior, on the other hand, goes to the care team. Uh, the care team meets on, on a <clears throat> bi-monthly basis, and we review all concerning behavior reports. We um, uh, staff them, or we uh, go through a threat assessment um, for each case uh, that we receive. Um, and members of the team include um, uh, Lieutenant um, from PD, uh, Lieutenant Jackson, um, a counselor and the director for DSPS, um, our college nurse, um, coordinator of psych services, uh, and myself. A um, lot of communication happens uh, behind the scenes, ensuring that students are okay. So um, to report concerning behavior now, there have been a lot of questions about, are we mandatory reporters? Or, uh, when we believe th this is happening or that is happening. I would encourage you to call our office and, and talk with me about it because there are limits on what we are allowed to do with adults. Uh, the, the rules with minors are different um, and in working with adults, you cannot always force them to receive help. You can um, offer it, uh, you can make it available, but we, we cannot always uh, force a student to receive help. So okay. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so when would I use the Starfish general concern option for a um, concerning behavior versus going through Maxient? That's a great question. Um, for me, the big distinction between Maxient and Starfish is Maxient is, is or uh, Starfish are, is for all things course related. Um, and so something concerning in the course is the student um, stopped showing up um, or the student is now disengaged where maybe they were engaged. Um, it, it's, it's more support for your academics. Maxian is um, the rules. The rules as it relates to uh, dishonesty, the rules as it relates to behavior within the classroom. Um, for me, that's the big distinction. I don't think I'm being very clear right now because you caught me off guard, Mary. And I appreciate that. <laughs> but again, um, the early alert system is really for the course, the grade, the student, making sure that the student um, stays in the course. Maybe they need a referral to tutorial. Um, maybe they need to be a part of uh, ETC or PASS. Um, maybe they need uh, some other kind of support uh, that happens to be social, um, where food or housing or clothing may be an issue. Those are things that um, can be very well handled within the pathway with the counselors through Starfish. Um, we use Maxient for cheating um, and plagiarism and for um, inappropriate behavior in the classroom. We have a little bit of time and Sean, you just gave us some really valuable information. Um, if anybody has got any questions for Sean, if you could post that in your, in the chat right now. Really? We'll watch, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll sing the Jeopardy song. Well, we'll put you on the spot afterwards then. <laughs> or you can dance. Well, I think th they just may have a question. Just, yeah, everybody. <laughs> okay, everybody on the counter. Um, we'll just see if anybody has any questions just in the next few minutes, just because sure. you just, you gave us four slides full of some really good information. 
So I was trying to be brief. Although we'll find out. Maybe everybody's asleep. I don't know. Let's yeah. see. <laughs> you must be present to win Lydia's prize burritos. <laughs> No, people can't wait for these. <laughs> There's something hidden in the tortilla. Okay, any well, questions? While we're waiting for questions, um, I will tell you when we first designed this, um, we were get, we we proposed it for Flex Day. We we go into lockdown, and we were legitimately going to uh, have Bobby Salazar's make a bunch of burritos, and we were gonna distribute those burritos on the corner of Blackstone and McKinley for everybody. And then we would host the session so that we had burritos. That's how burritos became a part of this. I'm sorry. We had good uh, there, intentions. Okay, there is, Sean. There is a question. Here we go. First question. Uh, uh, so go the ahead. difference, so for the difference, for how I just heard Sean describe this is essentially that Starfish is about resolving issues that may not require discipline but Maxian is about behavior that continues. Yes, that is a good summary. Perfect. Um, yes. So, yeah, there. Starfish supports the student in their learning. Uh, Maxian supports the classroom and the environment. Thank you. Yeah, that was that was good. That was very helpful. Thanks, Sam. So, what do you remember? Uh, what do you recommend for suspected cheating in fully online course things to look for documentation? So these are some of the wonderful uh, Magnum PI conversations that Lydia and I've had is, uh, and this is where we've gotten our distance uh, education folks involved, um, where we, we look at IP addresses, uh, we, we look at times, we look for digital stamps that um, uh, support the allegation. I think one thing that we have to remember is that in education, um, this is not a court of law, so it's not beyond a reasonable doubt. It's preponderance of evidence that we, we work with. So if when we put everything on the scales, if it tips 5149, it's 51. Um, so I, I would never call a student a cheater or refer to them as a cheater. Um, I would say there is evidence to support dishonesty here. Um, if I can add to that, uh, um, lots of screenshots and um, times and policies. I have classes where I have spouses taking classes together or a parent and a child or siblings. And um, you can immediately, if you start taking screenshots and creating a grid of when one person logged in and out, the first thing I'll do is message this, at least one student, whoever made the first post. Um, and I'll go back to previous posts. You can tell that the writing style has changed or, um, or I'll say, you know, uh, uh, tell me, are you the only one using your computer? Or, you know, do you share your computer with anyone? And suddenly the pieces of the puzzle start coming apart. And then, then I can say, and I communicate with them, you know, it appears that somebody else is doing your work or that you're doing the work for someone else. Can we Zoom and have a conversation about this? And most of the time they'll confess very rarely. And one time they didn't and they went all the way to Sean. And uh, this is why we're here today. But the student ended up confessing in the end and it was an online class and it was it's a little tougher when it's online but you've got you as the instructor need to be monitoring and that's where you know your gut will tell you gosh it doesn't look like this is the same writing style or Marianne logged in and then you can tell she logged out and then all of a sudden Lydia made a post and it reads just like Marianne's and that's where the lights start going off so and I, I would like to uh, uh, sort of piggyback on, on some of the things Lydia just said. The majority of the times that dishonesty infractions come to the office, students will admit their fault. Um, they will be honest about it. They're uh, usually embarrassed, uh, ashamed, 
um, things are going on in their lives and they didn't want to turn in nothing. Um, so they utilize other methods um, and, and they'll talk about that. So a lot of the conversations that I have with students when they come, uh, it starts out with first, do you know why we're meeting? And then I try and get find out about them. I, I always have their transcripts, uh, the syllabus for the course in question. Uh, I try and figure out what they're trying to do in life beyond education and really figure out what situation they're in. Um, how much do you work? Are you responsible for the household? Do you take care of parents? Do you take care of siblings? Um, there are a lot, how's your housing situation? So all of these questions then lead to, okay, so what happened? And um, our, our students, I'm, I'm, I walk away from my job almost every day amazed that they're here um, and continue to come back. I don't know that I would have um, the same amount of fortitude in some of the situations that our students deal with. Um, so I, I do want to say that I believe our students to be honest, and I do believe them to want to do their very best. And sometimes their cheating is um, a way to cover up for lack of time, um, not lack of care. So just wanted to say that. Um, Before we go to the next one, I, I, I need to be honest with faculty. Um, and I should have put that in the elephant in the room and it would have been my own is that it's very time consuming when you go through a behavior report or a dishonesty infraction and you're trying to pull evidence. And, and but if I go back to my quality standards, I want my students to be ethical. And I want the students that have worked really hard to see the value in that versus a student that has cheated because then that's taking away from the students who actually have done the work. But it is, it's a pain in the butt, it's insulting. Um, I keep telling myself, you can't get emotional about it because uh, um, it, it, it's really tough. And, and as Mary Ann stated, you back up and say, what caused you to cheat? What caused you to do that? And usually there's some other thing going on in their life. Um, let's go to some more questions because we've got some good ones here. Um, one of them said, if possible, can you speak to mental health issues in the classroom that are concerning and perhaps disruptive, but not necessarily a discipline issue? Thank you, Veronica. Um, yes, I, I know everybody has varying levels of comfort in addressing awkward behavior that may be a result of, of mental wellness. Um, but I, again, I will always say there is absolutely nothing wrong with looking that student in the eye and saying, are you okay? If the student says, yeah, why do you ask? Well, you're exhibiting a lot of concerning behaviors that um, detract from learning in the classroom. Um, let's talk about these. I'm sure Mary Ann would be a, a much better consultant um, for this or uh, Dr. Montano. Um, you are able to consult psych services to ask for help and how do we deal with this, but. Um, well, thank I, you for saying that, Sean, because I think that a lot of instructors don't know that they can call psych services for a consultation. Yeah, call psych services, say, I'm not sure what to do here, and they will consult with you. Uh, there's another question about a bot in the course, and uh, yeah, I, I saw a lot of this too. We we had um, a lot of incidents in one um, particular division where we were dealing with third-party websites and um, cheating. Uh, it took a lot of work to sift through all of it, um, and, and it's kind of difficult. Uh, you have to write letters to these third party places before they'll release information, but eventually they will. Um, and, and yes, there's always two sides to the coin where all the fantastic things that happen um, with uh, being in the virtual world and on the internet, uh, the other side of the coin is it, it may make it easier for people to be dishonest or deceptive. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we have the tools to to figure out every um, 
incident that occurs, uh, especially online using um, bots or third services? Is there any way to tell if a resolution after a report is made? Um, there should be. We're utilizing Maxian as a system. Um, I'm not 100% aware of what happens at the very end or reports back to faculty, um, but you can always call. Uh, I know that may not be the answer you wanted to hear, but if you would like to know where a case is um, at any point, you can call our office and we'll let you know exactly what's going on. A lot of times, um, again, when you're not hearing anything, it's because the student has re hasn't responded to the requests. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I know, Sherilyn, sorry. Okay. When you say call our office? Uh, uh, the Dean of Student Services Office. I, Dean I of Student Services Office. Yes. Uh, our, our direct extension is 8291. And most likely, if you call 8291, uh, you will hear the lovely voice of uh, Ms. Stephanie Powers Pawahi, who will <laughs> let you know exactly where we are uh, with any case. Um, okay, good. I think we've got all the questions there. Great Is questions. it time to spin the wheel? <laughs> no, not yet. We're getting close, but we're getting close. Next <laughs> slide, please. Next slide, please. So um, if your head is spinning like ours were when we were told that we only had like an hour and a half to give this presentation, we opened up a can of worms. And um, we uh, uh, real way we could cover this all in this short time. So what our intention was, was to give you a summary and address the bigger issues and then um, give you another um, opportunity to learn more, give us all opportunities to learn more before the semester ends and then do a whole flex, flex day strand. So our plan is because we were griping about flex day, it, it never made sense to me that we have activities on the, the Friday before classes start on all these different issues when we already have everything prepared for the next semester. So what we want to do is sometime closer to the close of the semester, um, have an end of the semester um, presentation such as this, and maybe we can con somebody into buying burritos on just syllabus statements and um, how to have um, effective welcoming structured classroom and student ongoing communications. Um, and then have some flex, street, uh, flex day strands in the fall on conflict management and de-escalation, student performance and intervention, um, meaning all of the um, student services, including tutoring, financial aid, pathways, counseling, uh, student support intervention, such as health services, uh, psych services, the store, uh, topics on cheating and plagiarism. And we want to do some breakout sessions because we know we recognize this difference between face-to-face -face classes and the challenges of doing hybrid and online classes for some of these issues. And then appropriate student instructor contacts and relationships, um, both good and bad. Uh, so, so we are working on those. And if you have any other recommendations, um, please put them in the chat. But yeah, it, it, this just kind of opens up a whole can of worms. But I, I just, um, I'm just really excited with the number of participants that we had signed up for this, and the number of participants that actually attended. And um, kudos to you. And as Marianne always says, we're singing to the choir, um, preaching to the choir, because the choir does the singing. Um, but you care about your students, because if you didn't care about your students, you wouldn't have logged in today. Um, and if you uh, feel it in your heart that maybe you want to lead one of these, come see us because uh, Mary Ann's already a little upset that I roped her into this, but she's the smart half of that friendship. So uh, anyway, next slide, please. We do, no, 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 we need to jam one more time. We need to do the jammy jam. So I think this is page four of the jam. Oh, I was just 
I was just playing with the Jamboard because um, it, it it was page four, but now now that's page five because I think oh. I think what I'd like to do because I see we do have some time. Um, I created a page four, and on page four, if you have ideas for professional development that you would really like to see, you can put it there on page four. So page four now is a brand new one, and it is what you would like to see, what you would like for professional development. I put it in a sticky note just so the page would have a, I, I don't see anybody putting anything there. <laughs> we had Lydia's list, how to create awesome videos like Mr. Messenger on YouTube, ideas and strategies for Zoom teaching, ideas for building community in classrooms, techniques to motivate students throughout the semester. These are wonderful topics. Syllabus with practical examples. Yeah, I, I belong to a teaching of psychology group and they have a what's called a syllabus project. And so I can go there and look at exemplary syllabi. Um, and that's been really helpful. Oh, well, maybe we need to be thinking about that, putting together a collection of exemplary syllabi. Training on collaborative classroom norm development and then how to best apply these norms during the semester. How to do all this in an online class. How to use Jam in Zoom. This Jam was really easy. If I can learn Jamboard in, I was self-taught. <laughs> Pretty easy. I see something in the chat. Was there some ideas in the chat? And we're going to save the chat so that we can look at that later. Training for administrative procedures, such as process for submitting grades, writing grants, action plans. That's, I think, beyond the scope of me and Lydia, but these are good um, just for us to collect. And Susie's our professional development coordinator. So these are uh, good ideas for Susie to pass along. Okay, the, the Jamboard will stay open, so you can continue to add to it, but I do see that we have the slide up that says what one thing you are going to do to create a welcoming learning environment, and that is page five, and I see a couple of people have already started to put some ideas there. I love the idea of discussion topics being chosen by students going to implement that, I think. Actually tell them I and others welcome them in my class, pause and listen to my students, check and edit my syllabus again. I'm going to send an email to students who receive an F at the end of the course, encouraging them to retake. I haven't done it before and it is a great idea. And students will reply to you and thank you. And I heard a story from a, a student who, a male student, I think he was Latino, who said that he had this instructor, it wasn't me, he was telling me this story. He had this instructor who kept messaging him, like, you missed the assignment. You know, I haven't seen you for a while, just like, because he dropped, he just stopped attending the class. And she kept sending him these messages, and he wasn't replying to her. He was overwhelmed with what was going on in his life. He was not responding to her. And he never did it. And at the end of the class, she also sent a, you received an F, but come back. And she just, she kept, and he said, she just wouldn't stop. Like she, she never gave up, even though I wasn't responding to her. And then he was back and it meant 
a lot to him that she was doing that. And I think about him because we think these messages go off and they're not reading them, but sometimes they are, they, they are reading them. And so I remember that, that student, right? When I am sending messages and they're not replying to me, I think of that student. It doesn't mean they're not reading it. They might be. Okay, Sean, is it time? <laughs> Actually, um, before we hand it off, Susie's going to help us. Um, but again, we want to thank everybody. Don't leave because we have um, we have two prizes, actually three prizes. One of them's really good. Um, and we've placed our email addresses up here. So if you have any questions, please feel free to email us um, and we'll go from there. So Susie's going to take over. We've got three different prizes and two of these are tortillas that I have wrapped up and there's money. There's money in the tortillas. So um, we'll do the we'll do the first tortilla burritos first. Susie, tell them what you did. This is so cool. Hold on, I forgot to share the. Oh no, I shared the sound. So everybody who's been here, I put your name into this wheel random, and I'm going to spin it. And whoever the three people it lands on will get one of Lydia's fabulous prizes. So you must be present to win. So. Here we go. I got to write her name. Congratulations. Down. Hey, Martha. I did get Martha's last name, so you have to help me when we're Magnia. done. Magnia. Yay, Veronica. Okay, hang on, hang on. Don't spin it yet. I gotta write, I gotta tag my board. I'll put it in the chat. I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Oh, she said yay. <laughs> okay, so this last one, if any of you, um, Sean and Marianne cued me into this book. It's a just maybe one of you guys can talk about it. It's 10 bucks on Amazon. Um, but one of you guys tell people about this book. It's a great book. Well, I don't know why you can't read it. Well, I don't know. I don't remember exactly how I, I ran across Whistling Vivaldi um, by Dr. Steele. Um, and he was going to be one of our uh, presenters um, right before COVID and, and we didn't get a chance to have him here. But his work and his research is based on a stereotype and stereotype threat and how biases are formed and how they inform um, our behavior and actions. Um, it is a fascinating read. Um, it is well researched and it is easy to read and, and easy to understand. So if, um, if you have an opportunity, Whistling Vivaldi, um, by Dr. Claude Steele. It's a fabulous book and a fabulous read and will uh, definitely have you rethinking the way you interact with the world. It's only 10 bucks on Amazon. And uh, I bought a copy for me and I bought a copy for, let's see who I bought got. And uh, you three winner people, these will be in Don Lopez's office to be picked up um, after one o'clock. Okay, so um, yeah, we have a little extra time if there's any more questions or if people want to just all stay and we'll have a little dance party. Um, but thank you all for joining us. And Marianne and Sean, you want to say anything else? Thank you. Thank you. This was really wonderful. It was fun to see new faces. And I'm guessing that Susie will send out some evaluation so we can get some feedback to continuous improvement. Absolutely. Important.
I'm glad you said that. I, we, it's one of the things that I wanted to make sure we, we talked about, so thank you. Would you believe Susie emailed us at 4.30 this morning? <laughs> she is on her J-O-B. <laughs> I think, Don, did you want to give some closing comment? Thank you, Adrian. Oh, yeah, thank just appreciate the work that you all have done to develop this. Thank you very much. I know um, uh, Lydia is not kidding when uh, Marianne almost killed her when we brought her into this because uh, she is so darn busy and trying to even schedule this was a uh, was really difficult because every Friday Marianne's busy all day long doing Ram Rail. So thank you, Marianne. I really, really appreciate the work that you're doing with this. You, it's, it's really wonderful that we have somebody is uh, dedicated to all of this as you have been over the last few years. So thank you very, very much. Uh, Anderson, you know how I feel about you. I think you're amazing. So thank you very much. And Henderson, eh, I'm not so sure about you, man. So <laughs> thank you all for participating. We really, really appreciate it. And look forward to uh, some upcoming events like this one. Um, if I can convince uh, Lydia and or others to do a few more of those, it'd be wonderful. So thank you. I think we have a date picked out already for the next one. I think it's um, Friday the 13th. That yeah, we, Jason. We seem to love Friday the 13th. So uh, May 13th, right? May 13th. May 13th. We're going to put something together for an end of the year, end of the semester. So, so uh, prepare for the fall. Do we hit up an interim Dr. Hall for a taco truck or something? Or we're going to have to work on that. Uh, the Tacos, jam. Friday the 13th. Uh, Sean, when are we doing the uh, recognition ceremony for staff and on, on years of service? That's an excellent question. <laughs> I'm not 100. Uh, let me look real fast. Because I'm, I'm hoping it's. It, it might be perfect if, if that was the same day, because I know that we'll have food available for everyone on that day as part of the uh, recognition ceremony, years of service, so. And Marianne, there's a reminder in the chat about the equity lab for fall. You were gonna give some information on that. Equity lab for fall. Okay, I don't know what to say. Uh, we, we are, we have two instructional faculty cohorts planned. One will be facilitated by Gerald Cantu and the other one by Mufadal Akalani. Uh, we call him Mac. And I plan on facilitating a one cohort for classified professionals. And Veronica Salmon Sosa, who's in the room, who was in the room, she might not be anymore, but she won one of the prizes. She will be facilitating the cohort for counselors, counseling faculty, perhaps with a co-facilitator. And I think that's what we have planned so far is four cohorts for the fall. So you'll just have to be watching for dates and times. We don't have those planned out yet. Okay, I think I think we're good. And um, again, this was um, a result of Dawn and Sherilyn and uh, Tabitha. Who else roped us into this? But really, kudos go to them because they were the ones that saw the need. So um, anyway, we're all in this together, and we just want the best for our students. But we can't serve our students unless you guys are healthy. So we need to keep you happy and healthy. And we learn from each other. We've all been through trauma, whether you want to admit it or not. Um, and we just want to do what's, what's best and keep moving forward and moving up. So thank you all again. Have a great Friday afternoon and we'll see you soon.